liar, because th those bones are essential for the whales to reproduce. Muscles attached to those bones. The male and female whale bones are very different. That has nothing to do with the whale walking on land, but this kind of stuff is presented to the kids as evidence for the evolution theory. And I'm sorry, it's a lie. If you have some real evidence, I would like to see it, but don't lie to the kids. This one says, the humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. I had a guy tell me that in a debate in Huntsville, Alabama. He said, humans, we got, we got proof for evolution. You no longer need your tailbone. I said, sir, there are nine muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some very valuable functions. <laughs> but if you think the tailbone is vestigial, sir, I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. It is not vestigial. I would like to point out there are no vestigial structures, and secondly, even if there were, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. Show me how we gain something. And even people like Pierre Gross, who believes in evolution, said, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. All you get is a mutant variety. And then the textbooks tell the kids that natural selection goes in with evolution somehow. Oh, come on. I got nothing against natural selection. Natural selection is a conservative process that keeps the species strong. It doesn't change it to something else. It's sort of like a quality control. It's not going to change it to anything else. But the textbook tells the kids, natural selection causes evolution, and that just simply is not true. Natural selection keeps birds, birds, and dogs, dogs. It doesn't turn a bird to a dog or anything in between. It's a conservative process. They tell the kids the fruit fly is evidence for evolution. All they did after years of mutating those poor flies is got flies that were worse off than Grandpa Fly. They got flies with curled wings and flies with no wings. That's not a fly, that's a crawl. They got all kinds of mutated flies. They never got a beneficial mutation. They're going to tell the kids, it's still in your textbooks right here in Little Rock, Arkansas, that the peppered moth is evidence for evolution. After 40 years of watching, exactly two moths were found on the trees. Two in 40 years. So they glued dead moths to the trees in order to take the picture to put in the textbooks to make the kids believe in evolution. That's a lie, folks. They're going to tell them there's evidence from similar structure. The forelimb of the animals is all similar. That proves a common ancestor. No, no, no. That proves a common designer. Chevy and Ford all have four wheels on the ground. That proves they all evolved from a skateboard 18 million years ago. No, it proves it's a good design and it works good, okay? That's what it proved. They're going to tell the kids the human embryo has gill slits. That was proven wrong 125 years ago, but it's still in textbooks today. Ernst Haeckel made up this whole thing in 1869. His charts are used right now today at the University of West Florida. And I guarantee that same concept is being taught right now in Little Rock, Arkansas, and it was proven wrong in 1874. If you have some evidence for evolution, I want to see it, but don't lie to the kids. Uh, should, we teach that the earth, should we teach that the earth is flat in geography class, since the Bible describes it as such in many passages? See Revelation 7-1, Psalm 24 2, 104 5, Isaiah 24 18, Matthew 4 8, 1 Peter 1 20, others. Uh, obviously, I don't think we should. The earth, if it says the earth is flat in the Bible, the earth is obviously not flat. That's been proven. We can't teach that in geography class. Uh, I don't need three minutes to answer that question. Okay. Oh, there we go. I didn't get time to boot up the verse, um, but the Bible teaches very clearly the earth is round. It says, yes, in the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 40, that the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. Here it is right here. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22. Uh, it says, the Lord sits upon the circle of the earth. The Hebrew word there is the word for sphere, a ball, a three-dimensional object. So the Bible does not teach the earth is flat. A few heathen a few hundred years ago started teaching it was flat, and they tried to blame that on the Christians. Uh, I'm sorry, the earth is round, okay? I don't have a problem with that. Thank you. I guess I get to ask a question first. Um, please state the second law of thermodynamics. And within a closed system, the change will always, entropy will increase. This uh, second law of thermodynamics is interesting. Um, the second law is it's stated many different ways, okay? And no matter how you state it, somebody else is going to find a different definition someplace else. So uh, basically, it boils down to the idea that everything tends toward disorder. The evolutionist somehow has got it into his mind that if you add energy, 
you can overcome the second law of thermodynamics. Now, this is, this is certainly not true. Adding energy does not help anything. You have to have something to utilize that energy. The sun adds lots of energy to the earth every day. All of it is destructive. Unless there's a system to utilize that energy called chlorophyll, which is a very complex molecule. If it weren't for chlorophyll, the sunlight is eventually going to peel the paint off your car and destroy the roof of your house. And when it's done, it's going to destroy the rest of the house. Sun adding energy doesn't help. The pouring your, filling your front seat of your car full of gasoline isn't going to make it run faster. You have to have a complex system to utilize that gasoline called a carburetor and a drivetrain. So the, the normal response to the second law of thermodynamics from the evolutionist is, well, in a closed system, you know, if, if you add in the first place, the universe is a closed system. Okay, where's this extra energy coming from? Secondly, I'd like to point out, adding energy doesn't help. We added lots of energy to Iraq a few years ago. We didn't organize a thing. Adding energy disorganizes things. The idea of a human embryo developing from two cells into a full-grown human, they'll say that's an example of the opposite of the second law of thermodynamics. No, it's not. It's following a complex DNA code, and there's an enormous amount of input of intelligent energy. You need not only energy, you need intelligence, and you need a system to utilize the energy. The second law of thermodynamics is one of the main proofs that evolution didn't and can't and won't ever happen. Thank you. Um, can I see the card? Thanks. Second law thermal within a closed system of change energy will always increase. Why? Um, I guess I guess I don't I don't really understand that. You have to have uh, an intelligent designer to I guess to overcome the second law of thermodynamics. I, I I don't I'm not really I don't really grasp the answer. And I guess uh, uh, I'll have to wait for clarification on it. Um, Things tend toward entropy, but you add energy to the system. Um, you know, I'm not a physicist, but I don't know. In two minutes, I don't know how I would discuss this one. So I guess <laughs> it depends on whether or not you consider the universe to be a closed system. And he said that it certainly is a closed system. Well, I don't see any evidence for that. Um, so I guess I'd have to ask for, for that kind of thing. Also, uh, it sort of fits in with uh, one of the questions that was asked earlier about how things tend toward disorder. Things are constantly losing, like we're losing uh, 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 our appendix or we're losing our tailbone or something like that. We've never gained anything. We have gained things. We've gained uh, larger brains. I mean, evolution is not just about losing things. Uh, you don't have to necessarily lose something or have something tend toward disorder to have it count as evolution. Um, anyway, that's, that's that question. Okay, I was given. Okay, oh, you're, 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 I guess we're switching back and forth. Uh, this is kind of a long one, but I'm just taking them. I am a junior at UALR, which is the university I teach at. You said earlier that you were not trying to indoctrinate freshmen. My freshman year at UALR, I studied biology under Dr. Lanza, an evolutionary biologist. Half of the semester was spent studying evolution. On the first test, I answered her questions thoroughly including quotes from various stories that I had read, but she gave me an F. The only way I was able to pass was by quoting her on the textbook. I was under the impression that college was supposed to be about teaching people how to think for themselves intelligently. If this is not indoctrination of you and your colleagues' theories, what is it? Well, I can't speak for Dr. Lanza. Um, I guess uh, the way this usually works in university is if you're asked a question and you have to provide you know, the, the answer. And if you don't agree with the answer, you know, I, I'll tell you a story I had in graduate school one time. A, a professor asked me to talk about uh, Neanderthal evolution. And I went up to her and I said, you know, I, I don't like the way the question is worded. And she said, well, I'll tell you what. You answer the question the way you want to, but if you can provide me with evidence to back it up, you know, I'll, 